Welcome to The Long-Term Investor. With me today is Dr. Joy Leary, a licensed clinical psychologist and co-founder of Shaping Wealth. She's previously served as an associate clinical professor in clinical psychology at George Washington University and has held research and clinical positions with Penn Medicine, Princeton Health, the Department of Defense, and Children's National Medical Center. Joy, thank you so much for joining me today. It is a pleasure to be here with you, Peter. Thank you. I'm thinking that we can invest in our listeners' holistic well-being a little bit more so than the financial well-being that I'm always so focused on in these episodes. I think some of the work that you're doing at Shaping Wealth is incredible, and I think a lot of people are going to be excited to see it. But let's start there with that holistic well-being. What does that mean? So when we think about our health and well-being, a lot of times we, you know, people he even hear the word health and they think, okay, that means going to the doctor. It means being physically well. But when we think about wellness, it really is multidimensional in our lives. So we have our emotional well-being, we have our physical well-being, we have our spiritual well-being, and we have this fourth well-being that is very real and impacts us as well. And that is our financial well-being. And what is important to understand is when we think about flourishing and the quality of our lives, each of these areas has a direct impact on the other. And I think that as an advisor, as someone who is often talking to people about their financials, I can see hints of areas where people could use some more emotional support, some more resiliency, some more grit. And really, we're trained in spreadsheets. Yet some of the work you're doing is to be more holistic. And as your background as a clinician, I'm kind of curious on how you feel like the investment in therapy or in some of that emotional well-being can be beneficial in the long run. Well, I tell people I really believe that the path to success is paved with self-awareness. You know, when we can be in a place of being aware of what our emotions are and know how to effectively manage those and communicate those in our relationships and kind of use that information that we have in a productive manner, it can make a huge difference in our lives. And when we think about this concept of what emotional well-being even is, we are talking about resilience. We're talking about mindfulness. We're talking about our ability to relate well and have intimacy with other people. And all of those things has a direct impact on the other areas of our lives. And I can tell you time and time again, and when we look at the relationship between emotional well-being and financial well-being, it is very real. So people don't come into therapy because they want to make more money. But I can tell you that as people become emotionally healthier, that has often a very direct impact on their ability to earn income, to pursue their dreams. You know, I've worked with a lot of people. They come in and I think many people create their own glass ceilings. Yes, there are systemic things that really can hold people back, but we all would benefit from stepping back and asking, how am I unwittingly getting in my own way? There are so many people who are caught in traps of under earning because they don't value themselves. And if you think about it, when someone is in a state of being anxious or depressed, they aren't showing up as their best self at work. And that is going to have a very real impact on your ability to then be earning and generating income. If you are in an emotional state where your creativity is just shut down, you aren't going to be thinking about possibility and opportunity and looking at the world through a lens where you see opportunity and you are connected to a sense of confidence and competence in your ability to pursue it. Now, for listeners who maybe there are listeners who have been in therapy, maybe there are listeners who have not but I think there has historically been a stigma that's been lifted to some extent with the idea of therapy. 
And some of these aspects that you talk about seem very intuitive. I mean, I know that I do my best work when I'm happy and in a good headspace, whereas if I'm angry or anxious, maybe I can get the job done, but the best version of myself may not be there that day. How can someone who has never gotten any sort of coaching or formal therapy recognize that maybe they're not clinically depressed, but they're not being the best version of themselves? I think when we think about this, something to keep in mind is when what therapy is not about being broken. It's about becoming the best version of yourself. So a lot of times what will sometimes bring somebody into therapy is symptoms and things that have gotten their attention. So we go from negative one to zero, but the real exciting work happens in therapy when we can move from kind of that zero to one and really help somebody look at how can I up level my life in all of these areas where am i really being held back and how do i get from where i am today to where i really want to be in the future and does this piece of that holistic well-being that you started talking about does this piece need to come first i think you can i think the great thing about thinking about well-being holistically is that you can identify any place uh, any place on the map and start a positive spiral upwards but i do think starting with this emotional place is a really important is a great place to start and if you do find that you are struggling financially understanding okay there are things that i can do in these other areas that are going to help me get unstuck and move forward toward my financial goals. Joy, a lot of your career has been, if not tangent or parallel, you know, very closely aligned with the financial world. And so naturally, money is a big stressor for a lot of people for a lot of various reasons. You brought up that it could be earned, it can be lost in investment, it can just be general anxiety. I'm curious, particularly from the time that the pandemic started until now, if there are any particular money issues that you feel like have been bubbling up more so than in the past. Well, you're right. Money has been a long standing stressor for a lot of people. And, you know, the American Psychological Association does a survey every year about kind of stress in America and what is at the top of the charts again and again is financial anxiety. And I think a lot of uncertainty throughout the pandemic, I think for some people there has definitely been an uptick in that. And I think what's important to understand about financial anxiety is it doesn't necessarily correlate with how much money you have. There are lots of affluent people who are very stressed out, very preoccupied by this aspect of their lives. And I think that generally where I sit, I'm dealing with people's anxiety as it pertains to investing more often than not. And there are some people, as you note, who are objectively wealthy and the stock market goes down 10 or 20% all the time. Sometimes it goes down 30% or more, you know, about once a decade. And I've come to learn that regardless of how much exposure to risk some people have, they're always going to be nervous. And as an advisor, I see the numbers, but I know behind them is the person and their real emotional being. And oftentimes we as advisors at PlanCorp talk about what's the question behind the question. And oftentimes it boils down to, am I going to be okay? You know, this really basic primal instinct that is probably true for health as well as wealth. I'm curious, when you talk to someone who has more financial-based anxiety, it's hard for an advisor, they're not trained the way you are, but yet you are putting together a program to help advisors sort of look at these issues and apply them to financial financial wellness, or as you call it, behavioral finance 2.0, where you're going past the biases. Maybe you could explain a little of what that work is like. At Shaping Wealth, we really believe that when you can have better conversations with your clients, that's going to lead to better decisions and ultimately better outcomes for them 
and in turn for you as an advisor. Here's the thing about human behavior and why we believe it's so important to start to move beyond biases. It can be so easy to look at someone's behavior on the outside and say, that does not make sense. I would not do that. Why are they doing that? And really look through it with a negative, judgmental lens. You know, I think even some of the language that we use within the industry about something being irrational, like that can be kind of pathologizing and in some people induce shame. And I can tell you a state of shame is not going to inspire someone to make to make changes. It's actually going to lead them to shut down. So we are training advisors to understand that really their superpower is empathy. Really being able to perspective take and perspective seek in a really intentional way to understand someone's money story that has gotten them to where they are so that you can join with them help them re-script some problematic scripts and really start to take agency and authorship and inspire hope that they are in a place and a position where then they can make different choices that will have them have the financial life that they are desiring to be living. It doesn't matter how someone's story starts. That doesn't just determine the ending. But what we need to do is step in, intervene, and empower someone. And empathy is so powerful because when we can perspective take and perspective seek, we can start to understand that often many of the choices that people are making that may not make sense to us, that we don't necessarily agree with, that we can see actually aren't in their best interest, are just strategies and attempts to survive and get by. In all of our lives, and this, this is true of finance, and, but it's true in lots of areas, we, we do things in a pretty pattern way. And usually at, at some point, our choice, our behavior was adaptive. Now, what often happens is we carry forward some of those strategies, the ways we kind of cope with stress, and then they kind of wear out or they aren't, they're short-term fixes, but they aren't long-term solutions. And sometimes they kind of expire or we grow out of them, and then they are no longer fitting the life context that we are in, and then that creates problems and create can create tension with the people around us. So being able to understand that that is some of what's going on, I think can really transform then the way that we are interacting with people while they are struggling. And you mentioned earlier that you're trained to listen differently as a psychologist. No one trained me to listen at all. And some in my personal life would argue I don't listen. However, as we train the next generation advisors and even the current generation of advisors, we are just starting. I know when I was graduating college, behavioral finance wasn't part of the curriculum at all. And it was a very, very minor part of my CFA exams, was non-existent in my CFP exams. But as you point out, it's less about saying, hey, this is how you're flawed and more understanding the motivation. And I think it is fun. I enjoy telling stories or when I give presentations, putting up an example that plays a trick on people's brain in part because I think it opens up their mind to learning something new. But I also like to say, hey, so see, you're a flawed human, but so am I. And so getting around that really does seem like a, a big challenge in training people. Where do you think the, the investors themselves, the clients themselves, can perhaps be looking for these traits in people more naturally? So people, we can't assume that many people have had this training that you and your colleagues are just introducing to the world. How can you find someone that you trust in a way to listen and be effective and proactive in that manner? In some ways, I think there are so many parallels sometimes in therapy and the advising relationship. And what what I tell people, like finding a good therapist is hard. 
And because one of the things that is so crucial and therapy research shows that it is the alliance, that connection, that relationship with your clinician that will impact treatment outcome almost more than anything else. So I explain kind of that client clinician fit really matters. And sometimes you don't necessarily know what that is going to be until you have some interactions with somebody. So I really encourage people when they are, if they're looking for an advisor to be really paying attention to how do you feel? Because like therapy with your advisor, you need to be able to play with all cards on your table because then when you are able to really create and present, this is the full picture of what's going on, someone is going to be better positioned to be able to help you. But you need to have a relationship where you feel like you can trust them. You know, the truth is money is a fraught topic. Money is hard for everyone. It doesn't mean that someone is flawed. It just means that you are human. And having having an advisor who is able to normalize that and I think is and validate what is going on for you is really important. Being able to work with someone who's willing to not impose their plan, but co-create an agenda with you and really join and meet you and listen so that again, you can connect and then that, that advisor can serve as a guide to get you to where you ultimately want to go. Again, and it's where the client wants to go because what, what financial freedom, what financial well-being is for different people, they have very different aspirations. And when we are working with people as professionals, I think it's really important not to make assumptions about what they want. Really check in. And when you really check in, so I know how to make to get a quick assessment of their finances. What are a few questions listeners can be asking themselves to self-assess where their emotional and, and mental well-being are? I think asking what are the quality of my relationships right now? A social connection and a, as we think about the impact of the pandemic, really checking in with yourself about how connected do I feel with people? Another question I think is what do I do to avoid discomfort? I think that can tell us a lot about ourselves. What the things we do to escape pain are things for us to really pay attention to and can be problematic. And asking what makes you uncomfortable and why? What is it that you're trying to run from? And you wrote something recently about how people waste time when they're really running away from their responsibilities, which I love. Um, I know sometimes when I have big projects, I start doing all the little tiny things that maybe are not the most important thing. Is that sort of what you mean there? Or can it be more than that? Yeah, I think that that's that spot on. And asking yourself, you know, when we think about emotional well-being, it's not the state of feeling happy all the time. But are you in a place where you can feel a full, you can allow yourself to feel a full continuum of emotion and not get stuck in any one given place? Can you fully and flexibly manage and communicate what you are feeling? I think that is a real sign of emotional health. You know, one place that I've seemed to notice more so in the past several years, in part because my in-laws and my parents have gone through it, but also watching the baby boomer generation converting towards retirement, is it doesn't always seem like emotionally they're ready for retirement. That's a big life change. And short, I'm imagining, I know you have young children, I have young children. That's a big life change. I imagine them leaving is a big life change. But retirement, I've watched a lot of people take a year or two to really get grounded and find their way. It's almost as if they're not emotionally prepared. I'm curious if you could share some insight on that. Absolutely. Retirement is a 
big, big developmental shift in somebody's life. And I think there are so many things that go into making this what can really be challenging. You know, I think so many people throughout their lives, they think, okay, I'm, I'm just working for retirement. This is the goal. This is the goal. And then it gets there and it can be really destabilizing because, and there are so many things that go into this. If you think about it, work for some people is so much a part of their identity. It's where, you know, the reinforcement that they get on their job, that's a boost of their self-esteem, their worth, that it provides a sense of productivity. And for some people, if you've had imbalance in your life, you've maybe neglected some important relationships. So then when you don't have that distraction of, of work, you are left with some of the natural consequences of your choices. You may find yourself needing to get to know your spouse in a whole new way and develop new relationships. I think it retirement is a really existential time because as people then reckon with this idea of transitioning to the final chapter of their life, I think that that can bring a lot to the surface for a lot of people. And they can look back and start to take stock of, okay, how do I feel? Is, are there things that now looking back I regret? And I think what's really important if someone is in that place is helping them see, okay, you're not done. It, it doesn't matter what has happened. Now what you control is what you do today and going forward. I think financially, it can be a really challenging time for people. Because if you've been in a mindset of, I need to work and save, and work and save, and work and save, and then you reach a point, a tipping point of decumulation, for some people, it then becomes very anxiety provoking to start to use some of the resources that you have spent your whole life working for because you're worried about letting that go. And that can actually create a tension in a couple if one person is like, okay, now let's travel, let's let's enjoy, like we've worked really hard for this. And the other person is maybe not willing to slow down or stop working and they just wanna go, go, go. And they just are too scared to let go of this thing, work, whatever it is that has become their life. But the problem is if someone waits too late to do, too long to do that, it can physically be too late. So these are, these are important issues to understand. Retirement is a huge identity shift for people. And you know, a lot of times when we talk about retirement plans, we are focused a lot on numbers, but understanding developmentally what's going on for people at this juncture is really important, especially if you see that someone maybe is struggling. That's a really interesting perspective. And I'm going to ask something I've almost like I've gone in reverse order of life stages that you have these identity shifts. Rewinding all the way back to the fact that you have small children, I have small children. I know that parents, when you're just trying to get kids fed and get them in, in a routine when they're not independent, can lose some identity, can forget about self-care, can perhaps let relationships wane. Is that the point in time where you're supposed to start thinking ahead? Or what are some ways for people who are in what is seemingly like a Ferris wheel that won't let you get off. It just keeps going around and round. How do you see people dealing with that or not dealing with that? Well, and I think that is challenging. And as we are in what has been, what sometimes feels like a never ending pandemic, like it has been challenging for parents and people who are in earlier stages of their life because it has been a lot of demands. We've been humans in, in the, tell people about the pandemic. If this was a psychological experiment, it would have never been approved because of potential <laughs> harm to people. Um, so 
I th- a couple of things. I think everyone just needs to have a lot of grace with themselves. And I think as we think about what we can do to be in a healthy place, we can't view self-care as this luxury. We need to treat it as self-preservation and understand that there are practices we all need to have to perform at our peak. And those need to be built in and protected, not squeezed in. Because the things we squeeze in our life are the thing are the first things to go. And understanding that this idea of self-preservation isn't selfish. If you are functioning at your best, you are going to be a better parent. You're going to be a better employee. You're going to be a better boss. And I think that is a really important way to look at this. And you know, as as we think about different stages in our life, there's always this tension between, okay, thinking about tomorrow and really being able to savor and enjoy today. And again, it's I think it's another sign and marker of emotional health when we are able to simultaneously hold both of those things flexibly at the same time. Because when we become too rigid in our focus and, okay, just right now, I'm not going to think about the consequences of anything later, or I can only be anxiously preoccupied for tomorrow and you're missing everything happening right in front of you, that is incredibly problematic and can result in real loss. You know, Joy, it's it's so interesting talking about some of these things that again can really get you in a good mental place and making good decisions, I think requires calm, clear thinking. It's something we often preach to clients to to try to gain rationality. As you said, as a word, calling someone irrational, that isn't very nice, but we want to be rational decision makers. And I think you've made it abundantly clear how important it is to be investing in your mental well-being, in your holistic well-being. I'm curious for our listeners, if there are any books or general recommendations you would make for people who want to learn more or go further down this path on their own. That's a great question. I I'm I love the book Geometry of Wealth by my business partner, Brian Portnoy. Um, that is wonderful. As I think about one a, a recent book that I that I really appreciated as a clinician, just thinking more about emotional well-being, was Brene's bon- Brene Brown's recent book, um, Atlas of the Heart. I think a lot of times what I find in therapy is people really lack an emotional vocabulary. And she does a great job of kind of spelling out what different emotions are. Because the truth is, all of our feelings have functions. They are, we, we tend to kind of bucket feelings as, well, these are good and these are bad, positive and negative. And I, I think the things that we can do in response to emotion are, can be more and less productive. But when you can have that ability to dial in and notice, okay, this is what's going on inside of me. This is what that is called. Okay, what information is that giving me? And now what am I going to do to act on that information? We will move through life in a much more emotionally intelligent, impactful, effective way. So that's another great read. Um, I also love the book, Difficult Conversations. I think in our life, I the quality of our relationship and the quality of our conversations is is really important and that's another one I would recommend. So that's by Stone Patton and he. I appreciate those recommendations, Joy. And one final question that I ask all of my guests. Joy, what does it mean to you to be a long-term investor? It means really thinking about how are the decisions I am making today going to impact my future self? Is this choice, is this way that I'm spending my time, my energy, my money, something that my future self is going to thank me for? Or is this something I'm going to wish I had done a little bit differently? 
great response. Joy, where can listeners and viewers find you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram. My handle is uh, my name, Joy Leary, and my degree, PSYD. You can check out the work we are doing at Shaping Wealth at shapingwealth.com. I have a Substack newsletter, which is my name, Joy Leary at substack.com, where I write about life, love, and work um, in my publication, Finding Joy. And my practice website is my name, www.joyleary.com. Well, Joy, I'll be sure to link all of that in the show notes at thelongterminvestor.com. And I can tell all of our listeners, Joy, you are a pleasure to follow on social media. You generally give me something I can think about or at least make me smile and give me a spark of positivity in the day. So I appreciate you doing that. And I appreciate you joining us today here on the show. For all the listeners and viewers, you can subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Leave us comments. That does influence who comes on the show next. So until next time, everybody, to long-term investing.